and I am going to introduce our speaker. So thanks for being with us. Um, we have had quite a year transitioning to virtual programming uh, here at Rockland Public Library. And as always, I would like to start by thanking the friends of Rockland Public Library for their support of our programming, both virtual and on site. And I'd like to tell you about a couple of those upcoming programs. Next Thursday, we have our second co-sponsor program with Camden Conference. Um, it's our second talk of the season, and it is going to be Daniel Bookham. He is going to be talking about his adventures in Amasalik in Greenland, and you're not going to want to miss that presentation next Thursday at 6.30 p.m. on Zoom. And in two weeks, we will welcome author Susan Conley. Susan is a Portland, Maine author who founded The Telling Room, and she um, has won the Maine, uh, Maine Literary Award for Memoir uh, for The Foremost Good Fortune and received great reviews for her novels, Paris Was the Place and Elsie Come Home. So we're looking forward to that as well. If you are interested in either of those uh, programs, please send me an email at sbillings at rocklandmaine.gov. Before I introduce tonight's speaker, I will tell you that um, everyone is on mute. So if you have a question for Ainsel, you will want to use the chat box feature. You'll see the chat box at the bottom of your screen and you can feel free to type the question at any time. Uh, we will try to get to all of the questions in short order. So tonight we welcome Ainsel Ponty, radio host and journalist, and she is going to be doing a few different sections in this talk. She's gonna give us a little overview of her career as a music journalist and radio host, talk a little bit about the impact of the pandemic on the live music scene in Portland and throughout the state. And she's gonna talk a little bit about some of her favorite music of 2020. So Ainsel Ponty is a content producer and music journalist at Portland Press Herald. And you've probably seen her weekly face the music column. It has been running in the Press Herald section, uh, magazine section since August of 2003. Ainsel is also going to talk to us a little bit about music from 207, which she hosts on 98.9 WCLZ. So without further ado, I am going to turn the podium over to Ainsel Ponty. And Ainsel, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, thank you so much, Shane, and everyone at Rockland Public Library for the invitation. I'm delighted to be here because I'm going to talk about my favorite thing, which is, of course, music. Um, so Amesel 101 is, I grew up outside of Boston, and my earliest, my earliest, one of my favorite music memories is I used to take out Monkeys albums from the library, Memorial Hall Library in Andover, Mass. I almost think I used to borrow a record player from them as well when I was about five or six years old listening to the monkeys. And then I also remember my parents listening to a lot of Ike and Tina Turner before we knew that Ike was not a good guy. But back in the days, I remember listening to Proud Mary. And the point of it is music's always been a very important thing to me. And, you know, fast forward to college and let me just take a beverage sip before I start to get hoarse already. Uh, I got very involved with my college radio station. I was music director for a couple of years and had a show on Sunday evenings, even a couple of years after graduation, uh, which was a really great, great experience. Then I moved to Portland and I've been here pretty much, with the, I left for a little bit, um, but I've pretty much been here since the mid nineties. And about, yeah, it was 2003, that's right. In the intro you mentioned, I started writing my column as a freelance writer, my Face the Music column for the Press Herald which still runs every Thursday um, in the Press Herald magazine section and online at pressherald.com. And I also used to do a ton of live concert reviews. We've pared that down quite a bit. And of course there are no live concerts really. Um, we'll get to that later because of the pandemic, um, but I, a gazillion concerts. Um, and then uh, fortuitous twist of fate and I got hired as a news assistant in 2011. And a couple of years later, I got a promotion to content producer and music writer and still doing my, my music column and interviewing musicians and, and doing some other things as well. But that's the thing I'm passionate about the most at the paper. And I'm very happy they give me a lot of freedom and leeway to cover a lot of aspects of music. And then uh, five years ago, I also 
took on a little side gig. Uh, I became host of Music from 207, which is a local music show at 98.9 WCLZ. And it airs every Wednesday night at 7 p.m. And then you can catch it again. It re repeats itself Sunday night at 7 p.m. So I love doing that. So it's another musical hat. And then I also go on 207 TV, the TV show, the news magazine show, um, about once a month and talk about upcoming shows. And a lot of that's been virtual, of course, lately. I even have a music blog, gamesonthemrecord.com, and uh, I make notebooks out of old album covers when the vinyl gets too beat up and sell them at craft fairs. So pretty much everything I do has some, something one way or another to do with music. So how's that? I think that about covers it. That's excellent. <laughs> Thank you for giving us that overview of sure. your career, which sounds very interesting um, on multiple fronts. And I think this would probably be a good time for you to talk about how the music scene um, in Portland and elsewhere has been impacted, the live music scene in particular. Well, I don't think anyone needs me to tell you that it's been dramatically impacted and it's absolutely terrible. Um, but what might, what might, some people might not understand is, is the gravity of this. Uh, there is a Save Our Stages, a federal act that is just kind of spinning its wheels in Congress. I don't know what's going to happen, which could offer some relief. We've already lost Port City Music Hall in downtown Portland, a 500 person venue that had a couple hundred shows a year. That's a huge, huge loss to the music community on many levels, the local community the touring music committee, the, all these national acts now will probably not come to Maine because they don't have the right venue to play at. Um, you know, and around the country, there's similar venues that all, all over Boston that have closed, around the country that have closed that will probably never open again. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot of the bands are like Brandy Carlisle, one of my favorites, she does a lot of streaming shows and you pay a little money so that she can pay her crew um, and I've done a lot of that. I've done some Indigo Girls. I've done a number of local ones. I've done a couple shows from Weekend Friends and you tip. And so I try to be very generous. I figure I'm not spending money on concert tickets. So the least I can do is, is tip well uh, when I do stream shows. Some of you have to buy tickets in advance for the virtual stream or some you just tip during. It depends. Each show's a little different. Um, and, you know, and some acts are, are putting out music, Andy Clark and Hatchet Girl and the world famous Grassholes, they all just put out new music, Dominic Lavoie. Uh, a lot of musicians are keeping busy, but it's tough. I mean, for some acts, depending on who it is, this is a large chunk of their livelihood is touring, like Ghost of Paul Revere. They can't do shows. They've done a few drive-in shows, but they used to do huge national tours. Uh, the Ballroom Thieves, same thing. They're a main band that is, has broken nationally. They do a lot of festivals, but you know, there's no Newport Book Festival this year, which broke my heart. Uh, the last show I saw was on, I think, the 8th of March at Portland House of Music. They're another venue that they're desperately trying to fundraise. One Longfellow Square ran a fundraising event. Uh, but every, everyone is struggling, the Strand and Chocolate Church and Mayo Street Arts. I mean, there's not a venue in the entire state of Maine that doesn't need some help. Some of them are nonprofits, some of them aren't, but they all could use help and you can help them by just making a straight up donation, becoming a member. Some of them sell t-shirts. Mayo Street Arts has a really cool t-shirt. I bought a State Theater trucker hat and a Portland House of Music Lost Without Live Music t-shirt. Um, anything that music fans can do um, is, is just vital. It, 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 no amount too small because we have to have art. I mean, humanity needs art and music is an art form, just like everything else. And I, I can't even think what it would be like if, if more venues close and if bands have to end up kind of dissolving because they can't, you know, keep their heads above water. It's, it's very, it's, it's profoundly upsetting. Of course, we need to just, you know, get this pandemic behind us. We need a vaccine. We got to just figure a lot out. I don't know when it's going to be figured out. Um, and it, it's, it's frustrating and devastating and it's, I get emotional about it and I've cried about this. Other people have cried about this. You know, I, I, I try to keep it in perspective. Of course we can survive without live music, but I don't really want to. It's, you know, it's, the, it's the live music experience is sacred to many of us, whether we're fans or musicians, not to mention all the people that are employed. Uh, the person who's scanning your ticket, the person who's pouring your drink, the person at the coat check, the person selling you your t-shirt, uh, all the sound people, the lighting people, the usher, like everybody, all these are, these are people's paychecks, you know, the, the roadies, 
the tour managers, uh, it, it, the list is endless. Uh, this is absolutely devastating. So yeah, that's what, to <clears throat> quote Forrest Gump, that's what I have to say about that. Thank you so much. Ainsel, can you tell us a little bit about the, um, Portland has such a wealth of music venues. Can you give us a little overview of some of the major ones and what their specific niche is or how they might be unique? What sets well, them apart from each other? Um, well, of course, you know, state theater, um, depending on how they configure it, anywhere from 1,400 to 1,800 people. And uh, it's just, uh, it's just historic. Bob Dylan loves the state theater. I've, I've had so many just profoundly, uh, the Sigur Ross show I saw many years ago, Damien Rice, Maggie Rogers, Tori Amos, Sarah McLaughlin, uh, David Byrne with St. Vincent, and the list goes on and on. Brandy Carlisle's played there a number of times. Uh, for so many of my favorite shows have happened at the State Theater. Sometimes I'm up in the balcony, sometimes I'm right up front. It depends. Adelie Merchant, all that was, cause I, you know, I could just go on and on and on. Uh, and, uh, you know, of course, I mentioned Port City Music Hall, so many magical nights there. One Longfellow Square is so near and dear to my heart. They're the nonprofit. I donated a good chunk of money to them. They did a successful fundraising campaign. I think they raised about $150,000, which will keep them afloat for, for a little while, thankfully. But that's where you get a, a lot of the um, singer-songwriters like John Gorka and um, Antje Duvacata. They're, 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 I mean, that's just Ellis Paul, uh, who's, who's a Mainer, uh, who have the list of people, Melissa Farrick, who have come through that door at, um, I used to have a spreadsheet. Somewhere I have a spreadsheet of every show that's ever happened there. Uh, it, it, it's profound. Uh, and, uh, and Blue, Blue, which is a wonderful kind of a jazz club, but beyond that, they've expanded. They can hold about 75 people now. I saw Donnie McClaslin there, and who's who's he, you're wondering? He's, he's the saxophone player. He and his trio on David Bowie's last album, Black Star. Uh, he played at Blue. That was a ticketed show. They get acts from all over, from other countries, and they also have a ton of space for the local scene. So a lot of local acts play there. A lot of the shows are free. They accept donations. And let, oh, Geno's, Geno's Rock Club and Institution, uh, all original music. They, they skew towards the heavier side, but you know, there's a huge audience for that, which is awesome. Uh, Bayside Bowl hosts a lot of live music. Uh, of course, Merrill Auditorium, where we be without Merrill, even the Civic Center. Um, they don't have as many concerts as they used to. Uh, of course, Maine State Pier, and now it's the, the Rock Road at, at, um, in Westbrook. I haven't been there yet, but Thompson's Point, uh, the outdoor venue run by the State Theater folks, Lauren Wayne and her crew, uh, is just a magical place to see a show. Uh, Empire, seen a lot of good shows upstairs at Empire. And of course, I'm gonna, we're going to end this, and I'm going to, I keep, I'm going to, I can't, I can't believe I forgot this video. Oh, I've never seen the B-52s at Aura. Aura is another great spot. Uh, we, ha we have a lot um, in and around Congress Street and all different genres of music, which is really nice. And now a lot of the, the breweries and, and the bars hold a lot of local, uh, local musician performances too. Of course, most of this is not happening right now. But when we're up and running, uh, Portland is, I mean, Rolling Stone Magazine wrote about what a great music town we are. And bands love coming play to come to play here. They love it. They love our lobster. They love our vibe. They love our fans. Uh, every show I go to at the State Theater or Port City, the actors always takes a minute to say, "I love Portland." Uh, you know, and you, you believe them because they say it so enthusiastically. That's so, fantastic. Yeah. Um, Amsel, being that you are a radio host and also a journalist, do you find? that you prefer one of those, or do you just like having more opportunities to talk about music, the better? Um, you mean venue-wise? As far as um, for you yourself, being a radio host and a music journalist. So you're covering music in multiple ways. Oh, right. Wonderful, because it's your passion. Sure. Do you find that those two things are different, or you're basically doing the same thing, but in a different medium? Um, I guess sort of the latter. Uh, I, you know, I do juggle a lot of things. But, you know, it's nice because I just this week wrote about, I mentioned Hat Check Girl, Annie Clark, and World Famous Grass Holes. I wrote about them because they all have new albums out, and now I'll get to play them on my radio show. And I'll do a little cross promotion. I said, hey, uh, speaking of which, you can head to PressHerald.com and read what I wrote about them. Um, 
they feed into each other. I mean, the, the music from 207, the radio show is just local. And my column is, you know, a, a blend. It depends on what's happening. I mean, when we're not in a pandemic, it's different because I, I interview a lot of national acts, um, sometimes as a standalone piece and sometimes as my face the music column. Um, but yeah, the radio is just local. The, the, it's I, any excuse to talk about music, whether it's a tiny little new act that no one's heard of, or it's, you know, Joan Baez, who I had the honor of interviewing a couple years ago. Uh, any any ex uh, excuse to kind of share my passion uh, and get people excited about music, um, I love. And even going on TV, I love talking about it on the TV show as well. Yeah, that was one thing I wanted to mention. So you have been doing um, live music previews, I believe, on yep. news, on the News Center show 207 for the past several years. Yeah, I think I've, I think I'm about five years with them. I finally got the coffee mug a couple of years That's ago. Fantastic. I they, and they must likely like me if I got the News Center coffee mug, the highly coveted. Uh, but I, I, I love the, I love those folks, and I you know I usually go into the studio, but we've been doing it remotely just to be safe. Um, Till we're on the other end of the pandemic, um, but you know it's it's been different. But I mostly you know now I get to tell people about mostly streaming shows. But there are still I mean Stone Mountain Art Center and um, Chocolate Church is doing some outdoor shows. Uh, Jonathan's and Ogunquid Booth Bay Opera House are starting to do some fifty person shows. And if you do it right, like I, I think I might venture to Stone Mountain soon and maybe see Jason Spooner next month. I think he's there October twenty fourth. Um, you know, if, if, if people are doing it mindfully and following CDC guidelines, I think it's possible to, to safely experience live music on a small scale, you know, which helps, you know, helps the band, helps the venue. So what we want to turn to now is some specific music from this year. And I have found that um, in spite of the pandemic this year, one positive thing has been there have been a lot of great books and a lot of great albums that have come out. And since we are fortunate to have you with us this evening, we would like to hear some of your choices for best albums or best music um, 2020. Okay. Um, well, I the word best, um, I, I try to not use because I, I've learned over the years that um, music almost it's just so different from so many other things. It's so subjective. So, you know, something I love just might not be somebody else's cup of tea. So I, I can't tell you what the best albums are, but I can tell you what I think are my absolute favorite, favorite albums Excellent. of 2020. And I've been thinking about it. Um, top of the list, no matter what else happens, is always going to be Fetch the Bolt Cutter Cutters from Fiona Apple. It's her first album in about a decade, and it's absolutely phenomenal. And I'm just, it came out in March. It was a little bit of a surprise. Um, she'd been kind of quiet for several years and it, it's an absolutely extraordinary genius record. And then about, I don't know, a month ago, I watched, uh, and out of nowhere, Beyonce created this uh, a phenomenal, I don't even know how to describe it. Um, it just, it's worth getting Disney Plus for, called Black is King. It's kind of a companion, a continuation of the Lion King story. And the soundtrack to that is Beyonce, but with a whole ton of guests. And I'm really captivated uh, by the cinematic presentation, but also the music. So I've been really digging into that. Uh, Kathleen Edwards, there's two Canadians, two of my favorite Canadian artists, both hadn't put out a record in 10 years and eight years, respectively. And Kathleen Edwards, Total Freedom, phenomenal. Uh, Sarah Harmer, Are You Gone? Just last week, Janelle Monet. Uh, dropped a single called Turntables. There's an Amazon original movie that I need to see. Heck, maybe I'll watch it tonight. Called All In, The Fight for Democracy, which was just released on the 15th. But there's a single called Turntables that I'm really excited about. Um, Alicia Keys, she just walked, I didn't even know this. She just released a record last Friday, just called Alicia Keys. So I listened to that all the way through twice a couple days ago. And I just, uh, I'm just crazy over that. Um, I can't believe I'm saying this, but one of the albums of the year for sure, Taylor Swift's Folklore. And I've always been neutral. I've always been like, she just seems like a lovely person. I really know Shake It Off and one other song. I don't really know her music, but there was a, a lot of, she, out of nowhere, she dropped the surprise record, Folklore. And I said, you know what, I'm going to listen to this thing. And wow, it's, it's like just this singer songwriter kind of dream pop it's just, just phenomenal. It's just proven what is what a tremendous songwriter she is. 
She even duets with Justin Vernon uh, from Bon Iver on a track, which is just unbelievable. She's just, just she's a chameleon, and I have just mad respect for her. Uh, in, uh, Indigo Girls Look Long, Phoebe Bridgers Punisher. Yes, I made a list. Uh, the Chicks, Gaslighter, formerly Dixie Chicks. Uh, Gaslighter, I have listened to that album probably 50 times. Uh, Torres, Silver Tongue, she's a newer artist for me. I love her. There's a ton. And yeah, you're right, absolutely right. I'm singling out the women because it's my prerogative too. Because uh, they still don't get played as much as men, or male artists on the radio. So anything I can do to champion um, female artists and black artists, I'm definitely going to do. So that's that's my two cents worth on favorite albums of 2020 so far. What an amazing list. So we Thanks. were able to get uh, Ainsel's personal picks for her favorites of 2020. Um, I did have one person who couldn't attend tonight who wanted me to specifically ask your thoughts on the new um, or the newest album by Alanis Morissette. Oh, Alanis. You know, I've heard a couple of the singles and, um, you know, I, I like Alanis. I, I don't love Jagged Little Pill as much as maybe the rest of the bazillion people on the planet love that album, her debut album. But I like a lot of the stuff that came after. Um, Under Rug Swept, love that record. Finally saw her live, actually seen her live twice. Uh, she's great live. And I'd love to see Jagged Little Pill, the Broadway show. Um, but I, am, I, I give two thumbs up to Alanis for what I've heard of, of her new record. Um, she's, she's always been uh, solid. Yeah, two Excellent. thumbs up. Um, definitely the Fiona Apple album that you mentioned seemed to get unanimously great reviews across it, the It world. is, she is just from another planet. I think someone needs to just do a blood test because I don't think she, I think she has alien blood in her veins. Uh, she, she's just wild. Uh, she just puts it all out there. And then, I mean, there's one song, she's making sounds, like I don't even know what is going on, but it's just... It's, it's just phenomenal. Like she's a genius. She really is. I remember seeing her at the State Theater uh, about, it was about eight or 10 years ago. I wrote a review for it. I've never been more hot. It was an absolute oven in that theater. She's dripping sweat. We're all dripping sweat, but wow, what a great show it was. Uh, I've, I've, I've loved her since title from day one. A lot, a lot of people, there's like a cult-like following. We bowed to Fiona. She, uh, she's an amazing artist. Yeah. Um, I want to remind you, if you have questions for Angel, to please use the chat box. And Angel, we do have our first uh, question from the audience, wanting to know your favorite 2020 releases from Maine artists. Oh, um, Annie Clark just put out such a wonderful record um, called Will It Ever Be the Same? And it strikes me so much because she, she, um, she had such an experience a few months ago, kind of in early days of the pandemic, it was, I think, May, and she was um, on, a, on a lake, I think it was Moosehead Lake, and she slipped, she was by herself, and she was very upset, just feeling just distraught about the pandemic and everything that was happening, and she was on a dock, and she actually slipped and fell into the water by herself and had to get herself out of the water before she got hyperthermia, or God forbid, drowned, had to get 20 stitches on her leg, had to get herself to the hospital. And two days later, she wrote a song called Will It Ever Be the Same? And it's just um, really uh, incredibly um, poignant. Um, Muddy Ruckus, um, it's um, Eric, Erica, and er, Erica, and what is her last name? And Ryan Flaherty, Erica, what is her last name? Oh, Erica Stahl and Ryan Flaherty. My memory is not what it used to be. Uh, they are one of the hardest working bands in, May, in Maine. And Erica just had to get a kidney transplant, um, a, a life-saving one, and she has recovered, and they've put out a couple of really, really incredible new songs. Um, Amos Libby from Akbari, uh, he put out an EP with Douglas Porter called Another Life that I absolutely love. Um, Dominic Lavoie, I haven't listened to his, his new record, but I'm excited to listen to it. Um, and you know who's going to? Uh, Amy Allen. I'm excited. She moved to California. She's a manor and she's getting ready. I think it's coming out soon. I heard the first single. Uh, she's already become a songwriting powerhouse. She's written hit songs for Selena Gomez and a couple other of the real heavy hitters uh, in the pop world, but she's doing her own thing. Um, Cause I remember when she was still a student at Wayne Fleet and she hand delivered her, her first EP to me years ago in the newsroom at the Press Herald. And now she's, she's well on her way. I think she's going to be very famous. Um, 
and great because she's uh, she's very talented. Uh, Ghost with Paul Revere, uh, their most recent record um, is really solid. I'm very happy for them. Um, yeah, that's what I'm thinking of off the top of my head. Um, but there's a lot of people working. The main never never disappoints. I mean, it literally never disappoints. We just um, we have uh, Oshima Brothers. They're always working on something. Buddy uh, Mallet Brothers Band. They're always working on something. Um, uh, Lady Lamb. Heard she put out a record last year called "Even in the Tremor." Phenomenal. She moved back to Maine, and I can't wait to see what she comes up with next. Next, she has an idea in her head, so we'll see when she gets herself into the studio. Um, I own Brambling. Uh, Excellent list. But, yeah. Thank you. Uh, what are some ways that we can support music um, in general, um, whether pandemic or not, in this age of streaming? Um, I, you know, I kind of have one foot in both worlds. Like I do have Spotify, I have the premium version, I use it all the time, but I also, the way that I support the acts that I care about is, uh, well, when we're not in a pandemic, I buy um, concert tickets and I buy merchandise. Um, I buy a lot of t-shirts and hats and buttons and stickers and patches and vinyl. Like I'll go to a show and drop $30 on, on a vinyl record, especially if I know the artist will come out and sign it, which we're probably not gonna have meet and greets ever again. But, um, uh, and, and tell other people uh, about them. Um, get, just, just spread the word about the bands that you And Excellent. buy their stuff, just buy, buy their stuff and buy their tickets to their shows. And, and some bands, like Amanda Palmer, one of my absolute favorite musicians on the planet, she uses a platform called Patreon. So every month, uh, I basically give a little bit of money to keep uh, her the machinery of her making music running. And Ghost of Paul Revere just launched the Patreon uh, not too long ago. Uh, it's a way to just not be bound to the whole to a record label, just be able to thrive as an independent artist and, and pay your bills and pay your staff and do your thing. And Amanda is like the queen of that. She has 15,000 patrons and I'm one of them. And it's just a small amount. But when you have 15,000 people picking, you know, picking in anywhere from a buck to 20 bucks a month or whatever it is, you know, it, it, it enables you to buy studio time and, and, you know, support a tour when you can tour and pay your staff and stuff like that. Ainsley, your sound just cut out a tiny bit there. Oh, um, um, that's I don't better. I know what I did. Okay. I think you're back. Um, so can you expand a little bit? Um, obviously, you've been a music fan for life. It's your biggest passion. You could talk about music all day long, but can you expand from your 2020 picks and give us just a couple, maybe five of your all-time favorites? Oh, lifetime favorites? Yeah. You mean? We know you're oh, not going to well, say best, but favorites. David Bowie, The Rise and Fall of Ziggy Stardust and the Spiders from Mars, um, Sinead O'Connor, The Lion and the Cobra, Joni Mitchell, Blue, You Two, Unforgettable Fire, uh, The Smiths, The Queen is Dead. Those are five of my favorites. I'm not saying that they're my absolute favorites, but off the top of my head, without thinking too hard, I can tell you that those are five absolutely favorite albums of mine. Those are five excellent picks for Not sure. Not to mention the first five REM albums. I mean, you don't want to like Sarah McLaughlin's Fumbling Towards Ecstasy, uh, you know, Indigo Girls, No Meds and Dean Saints. You know, you don't want to, you know. You don't want to limit. You don't want to ask me that question. I'm never going to be quiet. <laughs> but we, thousand maniacs in my tribe. You know. We those really are, do. <laughs> Um, what are a couple of your favorite live shows that you have seen in your history of live? Oh, um, the first time that I ever saw you 2 on the Unforgettable Fire Tour, I was very young, and I had pretty good seats, and they were gods to me. They still are. I actually got to meet Bono on the Edge a couple summers ago, um, but that first time, being that young, seeing my heroes was amazing. Um, seeing David Bowie. Um, I actually got to see him a total of three times. He's my favorite. I'm still not over losing him, but that was quite something. Um, Sinead O'Connor, uh, Tori Amos, Brandy Carlisle. Seeing Brandy Carlisle at Ryman Auditorium and also seeing Brandy Carlisle at Red Rocks. Red Rocks was a dream of mine to go there, and my spouse Tracy and I finally made it there uh, two summers ago and saw her uh, at Red Rocks uh, in Colorado. And that was absolutely phenomenal. And I know I'm missing a ton of shows, but those off the top of my head, 
those are definitely some of the highlights. Oh, and the Newport Folk Festival, having Dolly Parton be a surprise guest last summer at the Newport Folk Festival. I still can't believe I was there for that, and I was right up front. Excellent. So can you tell us again, um, just so that the audience knows where to find you, about your WCLZ show, when it airs, and the same sure. with the 207? Um, 207 TV is, is sort of sporadic. Uh, in fact, I need to reach out to them to schedule my next visit with them. So I have to be kind of vague about that, but it's typically about once a month. But Music from 207 uh, is on 98.9 WCLZ, and it's Wednesday nights at 7 p.m. and Sunday nights at 7 p.m. And then my Face the Music column runs in print every Thursday in the magazine section of the Press Herald, and you can find it online at pressherald.com. Excellent. Um, would you like uh, an audience? We are just about nearing the end of our conversation. If you have any more questions, please type them in the chat box so that we can uh, get those to Amzel. And Amzel, would you say um, that music is your primary number one passion ahead of film and books and everything else? It is your major? Um, yeah, it is. It, it's, it, it, absolutely. It, it, absolutely. And it I, must mean, I mean, I have, a, I have a line on my, um, a tattoo on my arm that says, it's a Sean Colvin line, and it says, but if there were no music, then I would not get through. Uh, just to have, just to show you how important it is to me that I actually have that lyric that she wrote um, on my arm. That is how important music is in my life. That's a fantastic lyric to have tattooed. Sean Colvin is another phenomenal. Oh, absolutely love her, yep. Uh, we just had a comment from the audience saying, I love your writing. You are a gem. Oh, thank you. you <laughs> um, and so let's close out by talking specifically, since you have an actual lyric from a great singer-songwriter tattooed, who would you say are some of your favorite, not best, but your favorite lyricists? Oh, um, well, I mean, Joni Mitchell, uh, Leonard Cohen, um, I, I have, you know, I, I can't, I know I'll get in trouble if I don't say Bob Dylan. I'm a giant Bob Dylan fan, but it is not lost on me that he's probably the greatest songwriter that ever lived. Um, certainly John Prine. Um, I do think Randy Carlyle is an extraordinary songwriter. Same could be said for Kathleen Edwards. Um, yeah, I'll stick with those off the top of my head. Of course, David Bowie, but you know, that goes without saying. Excellent. Well, Amsa, we have a very popular um, Facebook feature every Tuesday at Rockland Public Library where we do Battle of the Bands and we put two Ooh. artists against each other and um, our audience Ooh. votes. So this week we've had one of our toughest battles yet oh, and a co-worker said we have to get Amsel, um, Amsel's vote. I'm ready. So We've gone back to the 80s and we have Cindy Lauper versus Madonna this week. Oh, it's Madonna. Come on. <laughs> well, thank you. We've got the official word. I mean, Amsel. come on. I mean, listen, <laughs> mad, mad props to Cindy Lauper, but Madonna? I mean, come on. It's Madonna. I mean, I bow to Madonna. We could not let you go without uh, voting in our, in our future. Well, it has been a special privilege to have you this evening talking about your career and the live music scene and your favorite uh, picks of this year for music. I'm sure you've given us all a lot of recommendations. Don't forget that in Amsel's latest Face the Music column, she talks about a couple of main artists, Annie Clark, I believe, and Hat Check Girl. Yep, and the um, world famous Grassles. Excellent. Yep. So thank you for joining us. Um, I appreciate and, you inviting me. Well, we are thrilled and honored to have you. If you want to make sure you don't miss any of uh, Angel's picks, you will be able to watch her presentation on our YouTube channel uh, early next week so you can um, review all of those great picks. Thanks for joining us this evening, audience and Angel Ponte. Be safe and well, and take good care. This is Shane at Rockland Public Library. Have a great evening. Thank you so much. Good night. Good night.